Thank you for uh, joining today's webinar. We're gonna get started in a few minutes. Just more people are joining us. Thanks. So Carrie, I think we're ready to get started. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. My name is Carrie Shannard Kunders. I am the executive director of the South Dakota Board of Pharmacy, and I chair the NASCA Education Committee. I'll be hosting this afternoon's webinar along with NASCA's Kathy Keough. Hopefully you read the scrolling information while waiting for the webinar to start with information regarding our sponsors, uh, a NASCA disclaimer, housekeeping items and announcements. Today's webinar and all of our webinars throughout the year would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. So thank you to our sponsors and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar regulator and dispenser preparation for the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. I have a special interest in this topic uh, from the Board of Pharmacy standpoint, obviously, so I'm very happy and honored to introduce today's presenter, my colleague and friend, Josh Bolin. Josh serves as the National, as the Associate Executive Director for Federal Affairs and Strategy for the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. In his current capacity, he is the association's primary liaison with federal government agencies and Congress and directs strategic initiatives and partnerships. 
Josh is currently working with the NABP member boards of pharmacy on uniform processes and tools with respect to the DSCSA. Since joining NABP in 2005, Josh has worked on development of PMP Interconnect, multiple pharmacy accreditation and inspection programs, including accreditation programs for durable medical equipment and specialty pharmacy, and inspection programs for prescription drug supply chain, sterile and non-sterile compounding, and nuclear pharmacy. Josh also worked with NABP's member boards of pharmacy to develop standards for exchange and sharing of licensure and disciplinary data, for which we thank him uh, regularly. Uh, NABP's universal inspection form and multi-state inspection blueprint, which are all tools that um, are created to assist the boards of pharmacy in sharing data and conducting inspections in a uniform matter manner, excuse me. Um, this should be really interesting as there's a seismic change in tracking and tracing products through the supply chain um, coming this November. So I hope you're looking forward to this webinar as much as I am. Josh, please enlighten us. Great, thank you, Carrie. Um, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to present uh, to NASCA. I've been uh, involved with NASCA at various levels uh, back when I was with the Indiana Board of Pharmacy, and it's always uh, always been a, a great conference and a great venue, and so happy to, happy to be here today. So with that said, uh, just a little bit about um, NABP. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, NABP is a 501c3 charitable and educational organization. Uh, we work with our member boards of pharmacy to assist them and provide additional tools as they work to protect the public health. Uh, our members consist of the 50 U.S. state boards of pharmacy, as well as the boards in D.C., Guam, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, 10 Canadian provinces, and the Bahamas. Uh, this slide just gives you an idea of sort of where, um, you know, NABP's programs and services, you know, sort of uh, provide that level of support to the state boards of pharmacy from, you know, our accreditation and inspection programs, the examinations that we perform, uh, license transfer, prescription drug monitoring programs like PMP Interconnect, and then also our public education campaigns and the things we do uh, through the Safe.Pharmacy um, initiative. But what we're here to talk about today is uh, an acronym that I think most on this call have been familiar with because it's been around for a long while, uh, a long time rather. Um, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act uh, was enacted um, on November 27th of 2013. And what's happened over the course of the last you know, nine plus years is that uh, this act has been implemented in stages. Uh, so one of the first things that it did was that it eliminated a patchwork of state laws and regulations, in particular around pedigree laws. So if a state had a pedigree law on the books at the time, it was immediately preempted and shifted toward the model that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the DSCSA also established that uh, there would be new guidelines for state licensing of wholesale distributors and 3PLs. Uh, and actually, we had some proposed rules that were released on that um, early in 2022. So we'll talk about that in greater detail. Um, and then there were other requirements over the course of 10 years that have been implemented, uh, such as uh, wholesalers and 3PLs having to report their licenses uh, to uh, an FDA uh, database or reporting mechanism, uh, as well as um, requirements to only do business with authorized trading partners. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But then, you know, also, what do you do today if you find a suspect or illegitimate product? There are actually requirements in place today that, that dispensers um, have to follow. But then, as Carrie alluded to, uh, you know, the big date that's been out there for, you know, almost a decade now uh, is full implementation of the electronic and interoperable system. So tracing product, you know, down to the package level for each trading partner. Full implementation of that is anticipated in November of 2023. And so we'll talk a lot about you know, what that looks like, um, what it might not look like, and, and what NABP is doing to help uh, help support our member boards. So, you know, obviously the association has been looking at DSCSA for a while now, but as that November 27th, 2023 timeline has grown closer, we've started to think about this in several different domains. So obviously we were already thinking about the electronic and interoperable system um, you know, over the course of the past several years, but then the FDA gave us the gift. I guess it would be a 
an early Valentine's Day gift in, in 2022 of filing their national standards for licensure. So what is the impact of that on the state boards of pharmacy and on the other regulatory entities that regulate wholesalers and 3PLs? Well, the second question we've really been asking ourselves is how, do, how prepared is the dispenser community for DSCSA compliance? And then stepping it back to our member boards, how will regulators assess trading partner compliance with DSCSA, both today, but then also moving forward after November of 2023? And then with this electronic and interoperable system that's coming, how will regulators be able to request transaction information from trading partners when you're conducting suspect or illegitimate product investigations or other diverted product, or just investigating fraudulent activity how are regulators going to plug into that system? So first, we're going to start with the national standards uh, for licensure for wholesalers and 3PLs. So, uh, you know, several key dates. The as I mentioned, um, you know, the initial set of rules was published in February of last year. Initially, there was a 120-day comment period, and those comments were initially due on uh, June 6. Uh, thankfully, I think to uh, the pleasure of you know, the, the states, NABP, as well as the entire supply chain, FDA actually expanded out the comment period uh, for an additional, um, for a, a 90 day period this time, just to give the supply chain um, and regulators additional time to respond. Now, with these national standards for licensure, the key thing to keep in mind is once the final rule is published, that rule doesn't go into effect for two years. And so everything we're getting ready to talk about here in terms of where preemption may kick in and adjustments that states may need to make, there's actually a two-year period before that goes into effect. Uh, there is also, through enforcement discretion, FDA has said that they will um, allow for a two-year period for 3PLs as well, although the statute references that that's a, actually supposed to be a one-year period of implementation. So the first thing that caught everyone's attention in, in the proposed rule uh, was this shift from October 2014 guidance that FDA put out. Um, so what that guidance said was essentially that FDA would effectively establish the floor for where all states would have to regulate up to. That's what was implied in the 2014 guidance. What happened with this, um, this proposed rule is that the DSCSA and now FDA through this rule now establishes both a floor and a ceiling, meaning that state licensing structures that aren't consistent with the proposed rules would be preempted. So for example, if a licensing structure has requirements that are above the floor or below the ceiling, they would be preempted and then facilities um, instead would need to obtain a federal license. But one thing that's clear uh, based on looking at previous previous drafts of what eventually became the DSCSA is that Congress did not call for 50 identical licensing structures. It specifically rejected earlier drafts that called for identical licensing standards. So we know that there is still room for states to, to regulate um, and to use their existing licensing structures. There just is going to have to be some alignment. So then getting into the scope of the federal licensing process. So, you know, without, I think if you were to print out the uh, proposed rule, uh, you could, you would see that there are, you know, 172 pages in that rule and, you know, likely thousands of words. But one of the key things is that when it talks about how FDA is going, how FDA could potentially preempt a state, all that it says is that FDA plans to make information available to clarify who the appropriate licensing authority is in the wholesale distributor state when the licensing authority is not the FDA. And then similarly, FDA will help stakeholders understand who the appropriate licensing authority is in the 3PL state when the, when the licensing authority is not the FDA. And so presumably FDA is going to work to create some level of structure for states to assess themselves against to help identify whether they are in line uh, with with the national licensing standards or whether there's you know a risk for them potentially being preempted so that was something that you know in nabp's comments and a number of states that commented trying to make very clear that there needs to be clarity around what this process is going to look like and the process that fda is going to use to make these preemption determinations and so you know to that end um you know one of our other points was to really focus on the areas that truly impact patient safety 
and really try to protect the product. So coming up with you know uniformity in terms of what the qualifications are to become a, a wholesaler or 3PL, I mean, that that's fine. How products are stored and handled, yes, there, there should be consistency there. But does every state need to use the same renewal cycle or does every state need to use the same disciplinary process? Those more administrative things so that was the other area that, that we, in our comments and other states' comments, try to get the FDA to focus on those things that really impact patient safety as opposed to administrivia. So some of the other areas um, <clears throat> for um, that, that could come around and, and cause some inconsistency from a state and, and federal level. Uh, so some of the definitions, there are only these definitions are what are recognized in the DSCSA. So manufacturers, wholesale distributors, third-party logistics providers, repackagers, and dispensers. So there aren't these other types of um, types of providers that, that many states have. So there will need to be some alignment there. Uh, FDA has uh, taken steps to kind of publish and clarify who, what other types of entities may fall into what category, uh, but ultimately, when the final rule comes out, there will have to be some reconciliation of, of those facilities and, and where, where they're different. Uh, the other thing, the sh it, there was a, a surety bond requirement within the proposed rule, and the proposed rule is very, very specific about what that looks like. It is also very different from what a lot of other states have. And then just the general application requirements, uh, those are you know certainly variable from, from what many states have. And again, it does get into you know, separating out the general application requirements that maybe, you know, states have to require something because it's part of some other administrative statute or regulation. Um, those are those are things that will ultimately need to be reconciled. So other areas for inconsistency, um, inspections was one. Obviously, many states have an inspection before opening, but then a, then there are a three-year inspection requirement uh, within within the proposed rule. So then the question becomes, you know, is it that inspections need to be conducted at least once every three years? Is that the minimum or is that just the expectation going forward? Uh, the prohibited persons, unfortunately, the proposed rule limited the background checks just to the designated representative or facility manager. For us, this is a significant problem. Um, and I'm sure those of you that regulate wholesalers and 3PLs could attest to this as well. Very often, the, the folks who are trying to do bad things aren't the folks that are there at the facility. They may be the owners or other folks that are involved in the ownership and uh, control of the organization. So we feel like that's a pretty pretty significant miss um, on the part of the FDA. And we're certainly hopeful that they'll make those updates, at least when it comes to you know, non-publicly traded companies that you know, they, they don't have to submit to the other requirements um, at the federal level through the SCC and, and elsewhere. And then, as I mentioned earlier, sort of the disciplinary proceedings and other administrivia, and we're, we are hopeful that FDA will uh, carve uh, those areas out because we know those may be some of the even the most challenging things for states uh, to update within their statutes and regulations. So what comes next? Uh, first, 18 states uh, submitted comments. We thought this was a fantastic number, uh, to be candid. Um, you know, there are plenty of opportunities for states to provide comments at different um, pieces of, of federal, you know, regulation or, or policy guidance. Um, so the fact that 18 states were able to get together and submit comments um, at that level was, we we're really, really happy with that. So NABP has uh, begun to circulate, you know, our comments, um, as well as uh, state submissions with different congressional delegations. That's something that's going to continue. Um, as we, you know, get to know uh, the new Congress that was just uh, this been installed this year. Um, and then now the question is, what does FDA do? Uh, so they're really, you know, they, they sort of have three options. They could publish a final rule, uh, or they could publish an updated proposed rule, or they could publish an interim final rule either without or with, with or without a comment period. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a, not a betting man. Um, I, I do think there may be an opportunity for FDA to, you know, publish an interim final rule on the areas where maybe there isn't a lot of uh, pushback or feedback, uh, assuming there are areas like that. Um, and then they could take the other parts back and go back and try to finalize the rule that way. So they could parse the rule. That That is a potential outcome as well. Um, so next, I'm going to transition to uh, dispensers and what 
sort of their responsibilities are uh, for DSCSA uh, today. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that NABP has seen, um, just as we've gone out and conducted inspections of dispensers over the course of the past several years related to how they're doing with DSCSA compliance. And so some of the one of the big, I guess, kind of three areas where dispensers have DSCSA responsibilities today. Um, so one, ensuring that you're only doing business with authorized trading partners. Um, authorized trading partners have um, very specific definitions within the DSCSA. You know, for dispensers, you have to be, you know, licensed by uh, a relevant state board of pharmacy or state regulatory authority. For wholesalers, you have to be licensed by your regulatory authority. And then you also have to report to the FDA. So there's sort of a, a twofer there that you have to do if you're a wholesaler. Um, and the same same place for 3PLs. And then manufacturer, you have to register with the FDA. So that's, that's sort of generally speaking what it is to be an authorized trading partner. But ensuring that pharmacies have processes in place or at least documented processes that you're only doing business with authorized trading partners. That's, that's something that is in place right now. Um, second, uh, that you receive, store, and then if you're requested, provide product tracing information. And then that you only accept prescription drugs that are accompanied with that transaction information, transaction history, and transaction statement. So you're not supposed to accept those things into inventory unless you also receive the three T's, as it were. And then finally, having established procedures to investigate and then properly handle suspect and illegitimate products. Those are sort of the big three. If you go on the FDA's website, we've got a, a flyer that kind of tries to distill down what the requirements are today. Um, and so that's this is this is what's in play right now. So I, I spoke a little bit about our inspection observations, and, and so there are some key findings that we've had. So we've conducted um, roughly 1,200 inspections of pharmacies from June of 2018 through December of 2022. Obviously, there was a significant pause in there uh, due to COVID, uh, but those inspections were conducted through the Verified Pharmacy Program. And these inspections, they also included facilities that are engaged in interstate commerce, and they may or may not perform sterile or non-sterile compounding. So by and large, these are entities that are um, you know, aware of the regulatory requirements when they need to ship across state lines. And, and so the, the assumption or the working assumption, at least, is that they should also have um, the knowledge of the DSCSA as it exists today and, and what, they're, what they're going to do, what they have to do under at least today's requirements. So a, a few percentages here. So of those um, pharmacies that were inspected, 79% of them inspected did have a documented process for establishing vendors for prescription drugs. That's a good thing. But then the question becomes, okay, you have a process, but are you actually, are you actually following that process or following through on that process? And so as we were going through these inspections, we found that 56% of them inspected do not routinely verify licenses of their trading partners. And that 61% also do not routinely check the FDA's wholesale distributor database. So again, when you're talking about suppliers for dispensers, so wholesalers and 3PLs, that's, that's a twofer. You have to do both of those things. And it's apparent through our inspections that, that this isn't something that routinely occurs. So it's one thing to have that process in place, but are you documenting that you've actually done that on an ongoing basis? Or did you just do it one time and then you haven't checked that? Um, you haven't even done a spot check of that license over the course of time. Those are things making sure that you have, have a process in place and that it's documented for establishing those vendors. Um, another interesting one uh, that another interesting finding, not necessarily a, a non-compliance issue, but one that is of interest is that 20% of the pharmacies indicated that they purchased prescription drugs from other pharmacies. Now, this in and of itself is not, um, is not illegal on its face, but there are certain instances where it would be. And so to talk about that a little bit. So the exemptions that are allowed by law that enable pharmacies to sell drugs without a wholesale drug distributor license you know, these, th these include things like under 503E4, which is, you know, in those emergency medical uh, reasons that don't include a drug shortage. Um, another reason is under uh, 582, I think it's DA, um, when it's for a specific patient need. So 
perhaps these purchases, and, and we I didn't aggregate these out to say this percentage was for a specific patient need or whatever, they, they can't even drill down that far. This at least gives you an idea of, of what's, what's occurring at least at that level. So moving into um, just some additional inspection observations. So we already talked about authorized trading partners and kind of where that sits. Um, then it gets into um, that requirement to you know, verify that you have transaction information that the TI, the TH, and the TS are received prior to accepting shipments into inventory. And so we actually found that 52% of pharmacies inspected do not routinely ensure that that information has been received prior to accepting um, shipments into inventory. Getting into suspect and illegitimate product investigations, 16% um, of pharmacies inspected don't have a process to investigate suspect or illegitimate products. Um, that's actually that's actually a pretty, I guess, a good number. Yes, it's still out of compliance, but it, it's better than some of the others that we've discussed. And then in terms of how often, you know, do suspect or illegitimate products find their way into or how often do pharmacies have to conduct an inspection, at least with our sample size that we had, um, you know, it was around 8% that had actually gone through the process of conducting a suspect or illegitimate product investigation. So now moving toward those dispenser uh, DSCSA responsibilities for tomorrow. So dispensers need to be ready to receive or exchange transaction information with specific product identifiers for each package, and then to be able to store those transaction statements uh, electronically. And then, you know, as they're looking forward, being able to implement processes for package level verification when needed. So if you, you know, identify a product that may be suspect and you want to verify with the manufacturer that they affixed the product identifiers uh, to, to that label, there will be, you know, technology in some instances that's available to allow you to perform that package level verification, or pharmacies can pick up the phone in order to do that. But then also having a process to produce that serialized transaction information if your request either by a state or by a state or federal regulator needing to have a system to go retrieve that. Now, one of the things that um, that we've you know explored as we've been in sort of this uh, technology space looking at the electronic and interoperable system is there's a question as to whether pharmacies are actually required to um, to sign up with a solution provider in order to comply? The short answer to that is no. Um, you do have to have a process or a system to store your transaction information, but you can actually rely on your wholesaler to do that. They can store the transaction information, but only for the products that they sold you. They can't st store transaction information from medications that were sold to you by a different wholesale distributor or supplier. So pharmacies that have multiple suppliers will have to have some mechanism to do that. So whether they rely on a portal or something like that, um, you know, that that's how you can go about storing transaction information and not necessarily having to go through a process of, of signing up with a solution provider. Um, now, what your wholesaler can't do for you, however, is they can't quarantine product for you. Uh, they can't actually provide you the transaction information from, you know, from up further up the stream. They can only provide you the transaction information that they have. So dispensers will, will have to find a mechanism to go back and gather that transaction information if they're doing uh, a suspect product investigation. So with that, I'm going to shift now away from the dispenser and talk a little bit more about, you know, NABP's messaging on the DSCSA and what we've been working on uh, with some of the pilots and the proof of concept and, and how we're working uh, with our members as well as uh, members of the supply chain to try to help facilitate interoperability. Now, as of uh, the summer of 2021, when you think about all of the, all of the di different discussions that have been taking place around this electronic and interoperable system, regulators and most of the dispenser community had absolutely not been involved in that in the solutions or planning. There have been standards discussions going on, discussions going on around credentialing, um, but regulators and in, in, in particular small dispensers were simply not at the table. So our concern is that both of these groups would be left out of the electronic and interoperable system. And so what we've been seeking to do, you know, really since the summer of 2021 and, and even before 
is see if we could find a way to help facilitate interoperability between regulators and industry, but then also the broader supply chain, especially for that smaller dispenser community who may not have the tools or may not be able to afford to utilize a solution provider. Now, clearly, there's been a lot of discussion going on, so we don't want to completely try to wreck what's already been taking place with groups like PDG and GS1, but we want to leverage existing standards and work where it's possible and where it actually supports interoperability, but doesn't add unnecessary cost across the supply chain. And so this has really been our messaging, you know, since, um, you know, since the summer of 2021, you know, through public comments that we made uh, with the FDA. Um, you know, different public hearings that they held at the end of that year. Uh, we held a state regulator workshop to kind of understand where states are relative to the electronic and interoperable system. And all of that led to us launching a pilot in, um, in January that we ran through March of last year. And then the ultimate output of the pilot, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a little bit, is that, you know, there is an opportunity to kind of help build some more uniformity in the space, facilitate interoperability, and remove some of those barriers for participation, um, both for regulators and, and small dispensers. So some of the specific concerns that we had is that, you know, really, we didn't feel that the solutions in those discussions for the enhanced system had accounted for community pharmacies. So, you know, we did what we said we were going to do. We got training partners, state boards of pharmacy, and solution providers together help define business and technical requirements that also meet the needs of the regulatory and the pharmacy communities. And then we also, one of the particular technological discussions that, that's been uh, troubling is that there's been this thought process around authorized trading partner credentialing. So we talked already about what you have to do to be qualified as an authorized trading partner. It's holding a license. And then if you're a wholesaler or 3PL, you also have to report back um, you know, report back to the FDA. And so some of these authorized trading partner credentialing processes were putting really laborious and frankly unnecessary barriers in place that really would prevent small dispensers uh, for, from participating in the electronic and interoperable system. And so that was the other thing that sort of led us to not only take a look at what we could do to help our, our members, but then also the dispenser community. So why this becomes important um, in November of 2023 is, you know, today, if you were to go in and ask for a transaction history at a pharmacy level, they would be able to produce it there for you, either by, you know, going into a portal or, you know, being able to, to have that there locally, because the requirement is that that document passes with each shipment of the transaction as, the, as that product is sold and then moved throughout the supply chain. But in November, on November 27th of 2023, the requirement to pass that transaction history sunsets. So that means that in order for a regulator or any member of the supply chain to recreate that transaction history and understand the prior ownership of the product, you have to contact each member of the supply chain to rebuild that transaction detail. And so this is an example of, you know, one transaction history, and you would see you know, other transactions listed on it if you were to find this in a pharmacy today. But that requirement sunsets, and so there has to be a mechanism to go back and to be able, um, and to, be able to uh, procure that information from each of the relevant trading partners. So what NABP sought out to do is to see if we could establish a DSCSA interoperability network. So this would be a network to help facilitate regulator communications with trading partners. So one, we also need to make sure that anything we would do here would be consistent with the uniform national policy in section 585 and any FDA guidance that they put out. Because we can't create a system that has a different set of standards or requirements than what the FDA is creating because you know, the, what the FDA would create if they create something, there have to be the same standards used. Otherwise you end up with different systems like you did under the old pedigree laws and we don't wanna do that. So the other sort of value in the thing that we've talked about here is to see if we could actually develop and test a uniform request response standard for state regulators and incorporate in the DSCSA requirements and FDA guidance, but then also creating a consistent method for state regulator and trading partner communication. So, you know, could we sort of create a place where a board of pharmacy inspector could come in, they were inspecting a product, they could scan the product and then initiate a product trace to be able to go out and gather that information from the trading partners. And then another key, and, and you all 
you know, on this call probably know this as well as anyone, is that, you know, members of the supply chain are also going to want to have confidence that a regulator is actually an authorized regulator. You know, if they're authorized by the state that they are who they say they are. And unfortunately, one of the trends that we've seen is that you have criminals that are impersonating Board of Pharmacy and FDA and DEA officers in order to obtain like shipment information to head off shipments and, and steal those or otherwise rob trucks and other, other sort of criminal activities. So being able to have a, a uniform means also means that we can have a uniform way of sort of authorizing. So that way, if a regulator makes a request, a manufacturer, a wholesaler, or a pharmacy can be confident that this is actually an authorized regulator who's reaching out to me to get this information. And I've already noted, you know, leveraging the existing standards that are there, but our hope ultimately is that this will increase the efficiency of inspections and investigations. It'll allow, you know, the supply chain to rapidly, you know, um, rapidly respond to suspect or illegitimate products, but then also reduce the sort of manual uh, request for information that will have to take place um, after November of 2023. <clears throat> so at the direction of our executive committee, they approved us to move forward and uh, really like try to understand from our members, from training partners, and also from the solution providers, you know, how, how is this all going to work and how can we work together and collaborate to solve this? So in January, NABP launched a pilot that represented the regulators, manufacturers, distributors, and dispensers. And this pilot focused on what it would look like for a regulator to conduct a product trace on a suspect product. Now, this, you know, this pilot was really low tech in that we used emails and spreadsheets to simulate the trace requests and responses, um, but it did serve its purpose. The pilot ran for three months and we ultimately wrapped it up in March. The outcomes of the pilot were that NABP would continually work on data exchange methods for tracing. We would come up with a way to help, you know, kind of authorize state regulators. Now, granted, we, we know the boards of pharmacy. We even know some of the other regulator regulatory boards that aren't within the boards that have responsibilities over 3PLs, um, that have responsibilities over 3PLs and wholesalers. So coming up with a, a registration process where we can make sure that, you know, these regulators are actually authorized to make the request. A dispenser authorization I'll talk about a little bit in a few minutes, and this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the laborious process that had been explored from an authorized trading partner credentialing perspective. But finally, and, and most significantly, the biggest outcome of the pilot that included, you know, large and small manufacturers, wholesalers, um, and pharmacies was that NABP should lead work on establishing a trading partner directory. So and I'm, I've got a couple of slides on that, but that was the big outcome here is that there really was no, you know, one digital phone book to be able to look up who the right person is to call when you have to conduct a suspect or illegitimate product investigation. And we've been continuing to collaborate um, with other regulators and trading partners, as well as groups like the Partnership for DSCSA Governance and uh, GS1, which is a standards organization. So we've, we've fed that information from our pilot back into them and have continued to, to collaborate and find ways to help you know bring these uh bring these concepts forward and move toward interoperability so to talk a little bit more about the trading partner directory itself um it's you know the best way to think about this is the tpd as we we call it, it's a voluntary and no cost platform to help facilitate that regulator and trading partner communication so i mentioned it earlier think of it like a digital phone book um it it's going to help identify help state regulators identify, okay, this is where I need to go if I have to ask a question of XYZ wholesaler or ABC pharmacy or this drug manufacturer. So the thought process is that we'll be able to populate this effectively with the entire supply chain um, and then also route that on licensure, especially for dispensers, wholesalers, and 3PLs. Because you know, because of the programs and services we already operate, because of the information exchanges we have established with the states, this puts us in a position to surface licensure and kind of take it back to what's actually required in the law. Um, you know, manufacturers and repackagers, we're going to have to explore a little bit of that with the various FDA databases, but ultimately being able to bring this information together um, and harmonize it with what we already have, with what's out there in the industry, and to be able to surface authorized trading partner status in a manner that's consistent with what's in the law. And that way it will give other trading partners confidence that, you know what, yes, my trading partner here uh, is authorized 
um, in accordance with the DSCSA. And so the other part of it is we want to provide this functionality at, at no cost. And so being able to, a, a trading partner being able to claim or create or maintain their profile within the directory, um, that's that's a something that's that's just core is you know having participation in the system it's why we want to remove barriers from participation uh, you know within the directory we also want to be constantly monitoring licensure for these facilities so that way if there's a question about whether someone has the authorized trading partner status or not uh, we'll be able to surface that in in uh in in that manner very rapidly also you know we want to be able to make sure that if you know, if trading partners want to utilize this directory and the other tools associated with it, that they need to be able to respond to regular regulator trace and verification requests, you know, at no cost. They shouldn't have to bear a cost to be able to provide information to a regulator who's carrying out their, you know, their compliance and regulatory responsibilities. Because at the end of it, it's, you know, there's likely a patient who's, you know, maybe waiting to get medication, um, especially when you look at, you know, initiating or responding to trading partner trace requests for dispensers, or also verification requests to manufacturers. So that sort of set of communications tools um, is also critical. And that's also something we want to, you know, make sure that we can provide at no cost to the supply chain. So this interoperability network, um, you know, we want to, we also know that um, there are various levels of sophistication across the supply chain in terms of who's going to be using a solution provider versus who may, you know, be relying on their wholesaler. So we have to be able to support multiple request and response methods. We would still use the same standard, but to be able to, you know, generate an email or have a portal that, you know, somebody could provide their tracing information across. Uh, some of the more sophisticated Trading partners eventually may want to have like a published API endpoint where the information could immediately be ingested into their uh, solution uh, provider's uh, platform or system. And then, you know, we've already talked about that trading partner communication and then providing that pathway and that sort of minimum set of tools for compliance for the small dispenser community is another, you know, another goal for us. Um, and then also, you know, leveraging the existing processes um, you know, in pharmacy to increase participation. So if you think about it, pharmacy is the third most heavily regulated industry in the United States. So we can leverage the existing accreditation, credentialing, and certification processes instead of placing a bunch of additional barriers, which is which I'll talk about in a second. And finally, NABP, with what we're doing here, we don't want to be the system. We want to be one of many interconnected systems that are interoperable together because there will be many inter interconnected systems that we'll need to um, we'll need to establish those connections with in order for interoperability to work. So then finally, you know, regarding authorized trading partner status, and and you know, I talked earlier about some of the thought processes around authorized trading partner credentialing. Um, it's likely that maybe some of the dispensers in your states have started here about this concept of ATP credentialing. Our position has been since September of last year and will continue to be is that we need to focus on what's required in the DSCSA, which is the ability to surface ATP status and not on a specific technology. Um, this is something where, you know, we, we believe very firmly that if you're, you know, placing these additional burdens um, on especially the small dispenser community, they're they're not going to participate, especially if it's something that's not required by law. So you know we think that through establishing this trading partner directory and ultimately the communications network on top of that, that we'll be able to have a, an equitable, accessible, efficient, and scalable approach that meets the needs of the state regulatory community, but also the supply chain. And to be clear, we're going to use widely adopted industry standards to ensure that this is secure. Um, you know, there are millions of transactions that take place, you know, every day across healthcare, and so we can leverage those same uh, those same sort of standards for interoperability, but do so in a technologically agnostic way. That way, we're not you know trying to shoehorn everyone into one particular technology approach, like some of the other credentialing discussions have done. So um, up next want to you know just talk about our our goals here so with this network our focus first and foremost is protecting patients and protecting the prescri prescription drug supply chain 
Um, you know, it is at the heart of what NABP does with all of our programs and services is we support our member boards. And so it's it's the basis of, of this effort as well. We also want to make sure we support regulator communication with trading partners in a manner that's consistent with the DSCSA. We don't want to create an inconsistent or incongruent system. But then also we think there's an opportunity to help support um, industry in meeting their compliance obligations under the DSCSA. And I've already talked about being technologically agnostic and that making sure we can be interoperable with the different methodologies that are going to be out there from a technology perspective. And then finally, you know, increasing participation in this interoperable system of systems increases the safety and security of the supply chain. So you think about, you know, the processes of product verification, the tools of product verification and product tracing that are brought in with the DSCSA, those are valuable tools if used and if accessible. And, you know, our belief is that the small dispenser community in particular they're the ones that are targeted by criminals and by counterfeiters for these deals that are too good to be true. Being able to get them into the electronic and interoperable system and using those tools ultimately protects them and it protects their patients. And that results in a safer supply chain. Um, so what's next with our, our projects? Um, we are now moving into connectivity. So we have um, with this with this network, we're beginning to establish like baseline connectivity to surface authorized trading partner status with solution providers. And then ultimately, we'll be moving forward to actually conduct uh, product tracing and um, products product verification as we as we move toward uh, the spring and summer summer months. The other side of this is there's still a lot of work for the supply chain to do. So you know, NABP can come up with a a great whiz bang tool to go out and request tracing information, but there's some baseline levels of work that need to occur within each sector just to get the data moved on to the next trading partner and just to make sure that that data is of the right quality and that it's correct. And so that's the other side of what um, of what we're trying to um, of what we're trying to work through here is yes, we want to move this initiative forward. But we also recognize that the trading partners themselves still have a lot of work to do to get ready for November of 2023. So we want to we're trying to strike that balance of still moving forward, but doing so in a way that that is supportive and, and not not distracting. So what comes next for us um, overall? So uh, one of the other initiatives that we just kicked off over the course of the last couple of weeks is, is a more intensive level of education and support uh, for regulators. So. We're working on a DSCSA implementation toolkit for regulators. And while we have some ideas for what we think should go into this toolkit, we really want to hear from the regulators themselves to help understand like what, you know, what keeps you up at night when you think about DSCSA implementation? You know, what challenges are you having in your state? You know, have, you know, are you feeling confident about where you are with DSCSA? And so we're going to be having some working sessions, you know, throughout, they'll probably be scheduled later this month and then into March. So we can better define what the needs of the states are, because obviously if we're going to put resources toward building these sort of tools for, for the states, we want to make sure we're building the right things. Another key component um, for NABP is also education and support for dispensers. Uh, there's a great resource that we've collaborated on with uh, a lot of uh, industry uh, industry groups and other professional organizations such as uh, APHA, ASHP, NCPA, um, HDA, and uh, NACDS. I'm, I'm leaving someone out of, out of that, I'm sure. But if you go and visit dscsa.pharmacy, there's a lot of really good information that's just focused on the dispenser community. So we're going to continue to populate um, populate that website and increase the level of engagement, you know, through webinars. Uh, there's a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks with an ABP and FDA and APHA, uh, the APHA is sponsoring. Um, and then we have, you know, state pharmacy association meetings that we're scheduled to attend and present at. We'll be at the board of pharmacy meetings as well. Uh, but dispenser education is going to be key, especially when, you know, there's this unknown about where uh, the FDA is when they look at whether there's going to be enforcement discretion. And, and before everybody gets anxious about that, you know, one of the things that is in is in the DSCSA is that the FDA has to conduct um, a small business study and a small business evaluation to impact the ultimately what would the impact be on, on the small uh, businesses and small dispensers. They haven't conducted that yet. 
And so that's something that the presumption is that has to be done before they can actually enforce aspects of the law on that community. So while we haven't heard anything official from the FDA about enforcement discretion, um, that is the specter of that is out there, at least for a small portion um, of the supply chain. So there's there's that that's that's in play as well as well. And then finally, we're going to be launching the trading partner directory and that interoperability network this summer. And then we'll begin, you know, continue to onboard uh, facilities, you know, pharmacies and members of the supply chain um, into that as we move toward November of 2023. And then finally, here are some other uh, hopefully helpful links um, just to, to different uh, blog posts, articles. Uh, the tracing pilot report that we did uh, last year is available on our website here. There's also a demonstration that we conducted back in November of the interoperability network just to kind of show, because it's, it's hard to think of concepts like verification and tracing and trading partners and all of that. Um, so that's why we built a proof of concept to help show like how this would work uh, from a practical standpoint. And so that's available on YouTube. And I know I think these slides will be uh, sent out um, after the fact. Um, and then ultimately, there's then there's just the press release that we have about what we're doing with the interoperability network. So we're going to continue to you know stay in touch you know, with NASCA about where we're headed. Um, and what's happening. And, and certainly, you know, NABP and NASCA have long been uh, good partners, and we want to continue to help help support NASCA and, and your, your membership. Um, and so uh, we sincerely appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you all today. Um, and with the time that's left, I'd be happy to answer um, any questions that anyone has. So, great. I, I do have one question, but if anybody has um, additional questions, you can pose them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and you may have touched on this. Um, it, what, what tools are being developed to assist regulators and what are the projected costs? Okay, sure. So the tools, well, I, I can speak to cost first. So whatever NEBP develops to help support regulators from a DSCSA perspective, whether it's the the network or you know model inspection forms or other tools, there, there's no cost associated with that. Um, that's that's just what what we would do, you know, to help support our members. Um, but then also we know that there are other regulatory bodies that are outside of the boards of pharmacy that have compliance or, um, that have authority over wholesalers and 3PLs. And we would certainly extend, you know, that that same um, that same sort of offer of education and support to those to those boards as well that fall outside of the Board of Pharmacy. Okay, any other questions? A lot of great information. Absolutely. While we wait, I'll kind of do some concluding remarks to see if anyone wants to add anything to the chat while we do that. And Josh, on um, Super fantastic and uh, lots of information presented in a really short time. So uh, you can talk pretty fast. Thank you for sharing your insight and your expertise uh, through this presentation. I know these presentations have matured uh, over the last few months as I've, I've been on a few of them. And so I really appreciate the new information that you're providing to us. Um, I'm sure the rest of the audience has also enjoyed it. So um, I know a couple of additional good. questions, actually. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, I can I can see the if you oh, okay. to take those. Yeah. Um, so the first question from Scott Ireland: um, the two-year period before the rule goes into effect is from the time the rule is published. So does that mean that the rule is not going to be enforced until 2025? Great question, and obviously bears uh, clarifying. So. Uh, what the statute actually says is that from the time the rule is final, um, then that two-year clock starts. So if the FDA were to publish the final rule on uh, February 9th of 2023, then the rule wouldn't go into effect until February 9th of 2025. FDA has not published the final rule yet. It is still in draft form. And then they can either, um, you know, they could publish a final rule at any point, or they could propose a new rule or a, an amended rule, or they could publish an interim final rule and sort of parse out aspects of, of the rule and, and go back and, and work on um, others. 
Um, and then the other uh, the other question from Doug Lang. So are you aware of any database or drug file that will be maintained as a data field for what drug products are DSCSA eligible to be to be traced? So we're going to leverage existing databases. Um, there are, you know, you've got you've obviously at NDC, you also have um, you know, what's called a, a G10, which is one of the numbers that issued um that's issued uh, by GS1. That's one of the numbers that's also affixed to the, the product packaging. And so being able to link that G10 back to the manufacturer is going to be, you know, that's that's going to be cr critically important. So we're going to be working with GS1 uh, to make sure that we can um, effectively do that. Last call for questions. There was quite a few comments. Um, thanking, thanking you, Josh, for your your great uh, presentation. Hold on, I think. Let's see if I see anything more. And uh, for those, I and I apologize. I I don't know if my contact information is posted, but um, anyone who wants to reach out or has any additional follow up questions. My email address is jbolin at nabp.pharmacy. Um, I would try to place it in the chat, but I don't know if I can. Um, yeah, if not, I you, people can reach out to me also. Great. Yep. I think that's probably it. Not that our heads aren't spinning, uh, those of us who will have to be dealing with this. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you to our speaker, Josh Bolin. Uh, thank you, Kathy Keo. This has been excellent education for NASCA's membership. On behalf of the National Association of State Controlled Substance Authorities, I would like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Again, thank you to our sponsors for making the webinar possible, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.